to continue in our series, Songs for the Not So Jolly. Last week we attempted to expound on the angel song when they appeared to the shepherds, uh, when they said, peace on earth, good will toward men. Today I want to look at a familiar song in Luke chapter 1. I want to take a look at Mary's song. Luke chapter 1, verse 46, when you have secured that scripture, signify by saying amen. amen. Listen to what it says. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, and he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offsprings forever. I want to talk about what the Lord's help in your prayers, singing in the midst of it all. Singing in the midst of it all. Beloved, music is a universal language. Someone can testify that good music transcends space, time, color, and generations. Music has a way of giving voice and interpretation to often to what we can always put into words. Someone can testify there have been times when you have felt a certain kind of way. And you couldn't quite put it into words. All you could do was wait. And while you were waiting, your song came on the radio. And you said, that's how I feel. There are times when we are melancholy. And sometimes there are times when we are joyous. We can't quite find the vocabulary. And we find on our phone our favorite song or our iPod. Or if you're from a, another generation, you get your CD or your cassette or your record player and you put it on and say, this is how I feel. Even those who are deaf know the power of song because even though they can't hear, they can feel the rhythm and the vibrations of song. Consider with me, church, this morning the power of a song, that old familiar happy birthday song. It doesn't mean much at times, but and even at times it appears to be cliche, but when God allows you to see another year, the happy birthday song is a reminder that God has left you another year on the planet. Many of us, we remember that song, for he's a jolly good fellow. Oftentimes that is sung in workplaces when individuals have made it to a significant milestone in their career. They contributed something significant to the company and the co-workers gather around and they sing, for he's a jolly good fellow. Many of us, we know the sound of pomp and circumstance when we find ourselves in auditoriums and arenas and we hear the sound of pomp and circumstance and everyone stands to their feet to receive the graduates that are adorned in their academic regalia, getting ready to commence into the world. We know the power of a song. Someone knows there are certain songs that set a romantic atmosphere for romantic exchange. There are songs, church, that I lean on when I'm weary and tired, when anxiety grips my heart and sometimes I don't know which way to turn. I pull out that old hymnal that sits behind my desk in this building and it, these are the words of the hymn that I find myself singing when peace like a river 
attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And then there are other times that anxiety does not have my heart grip, but I'm confident, but I'm in between the not, and the now and the not yet. So I say I have to praise God anyway, but I don't always feel like praising God. So I start singing a song like this, praise is what I do. Even when I'm going through, I vow to praise you through the good and the bad, the happy or the sad. Because praise is what I do. There's something about the power of song when I'm trusting in God. I find myself walking through the corridors of our church and I'm singing the song, Tis So Sweet. To trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, there is power in song. This is what we have going on here in our text. We have Mary. She has broken forth into a song. She had a visit with her cousin Elizabeth. And there's favor on her life. And she has favor on her life. She breaks out into a song. But wait a minute before we affirm Mary this morning. We have to consider the circumstances that she's in that causes her to sing. At first glance, it doesn't seem like she should be singing because an angel interrupts the equilibrium of her life. Gabriel comes in and invades Mary's privacy and says, blessed are you among women and you will carry the Christ child. You have been impregnated by the Holy Ghost. Now we shout on that, but there's tension because Mary is engaged to Joseph. She's a virgin. She's in between the ages of 13 and 14 years old. And if she's found out that she has been with another man, she could be stoned to death. And her husband, her fiance, Joseph, has splintered hands. But once he gets the news that she has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit, not only would his hands be splintered, but his heart would be splintered also. And now she has to go around around and tell people God is my baby's daddy. How do you handle life when God is your baby's father? Can you imagine the chatter around town? Can you imagine how people are talking about her? Maybe Mary has slipped off in the night and had a night of illicit relations. Maybe some man had robbed her of her innocence in a fit of rage and raped her. She has favor on her life, but she's full of anxiety and frustration. Can I park there for a moment this morning, church? Oftentimes, we become envious when we see the favor on some one else's life, but we don't always know the frustration and the fatigue that they had to endure to have what they had. You are envious of somebody else's relationship, but you don't know what they had to go through to keep that relationship. You find yourself envious of the favor that somebody lives on another side of town, but you don't know how much overtime they had to put in. Favor comes with favor also comes fatigue. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you look at the outside. But you don't know what I had to go through to get it here. You don't know how many sleepless nights. You don't know how I had to burn the midnight oil. You don't know how long I had to pray. You see me dressed up, but you don't see the scars underneath my makeup. You don't see the scars underneath my suit. She's favored, but there's fatigue. There's also frustration. You would think Mary would do everything else except sing. You would think Mary would be shaking her hand or her fist at God and says, God, have you left me out here like this? But instead, Mary decides to sing 
through her anxieties and her frustration. That's what I came to tell somebody. Yes, Christmas can be chaotic. Yes, but you got to learn how to sing through the chaos. You have to sing through the chaos of having bills. You have to sing through the chaos of you've been praying for a child and they have yet to meet the mark. You have to sing even through the struggle of struggles in your marriage. You got to learn how to sing. Go in your phone and find you a song. Go in your iPod and find you a song. Pick up your hymn book and find you a song. And if you can't find a song, write your own song. Borrow a verse from over there and a verse from over here and learn how to make music in the midst of a chaotic existence. This is the take home truth. I'm in my seat today. God's involvement in our lives and in history is worthy of our praise. God's involvement in our lives and in history is worthy of our praise. This is the deed to do. Maintain trusting lyrics concerning God in the midst of trying seasons. Maintain trusting lyrics concerning God in the midst of trying seasons. So this is the relevant question I want to raise this morning. What should motivate us to sing in the midst of Christmas chaos? Somebody can testify, Christmas is not always jolly for you. And you said, Reverend, sing. How can I sing? Let me give you the first reason. Because God's hand is on your life. Look at how the text opens. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. It's personal. She says, my soul. She doesn't wait for anybody else. It is a personal commitment. Can I tell you, sometimes you will find yourself in communities with people that don't want to praise God. But you have to make up in your mind that God is always worthy of your praise because only you know what God has done for you. I refuse to allow my praise to be predicated on how well the choir sings. I refuse to allow my praise to be predicated if the sermon is based on what I want. But I praise God because he's worthy and I know what God has done for me. I'm not going to wait on you. I'm not going to let you douse my fire because I know who woke me up this morning. I know who started me on my way. I know who kept my mind when I should have lost my mind. So since I know I'm going to praise them, she says my soul magnifies. This word magnify literally means to extol, to glory, to make one large. That's what I came to tell somebody. You got to make God large. And the larger you make God, the smaller your problems become. Oh, somebody, if you're looking for a place to shout, that's where you shout. When you make God big, your problems become smaller. It doesn't mean that your problems are erased, but when your soul's focus is on God, yes, I got bills, but if I keep my focus on God, God is going to give me a way to pay my bills. When I keep my focus on God, I know my children ain't doing what's right, but I can go to bed at night because God has given me peace on the inside that I know wherever I'm not God is. You got to learn how to make God larger and the larger you make God, the smaller your problems. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, make God large. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord because the Lord has looked upon my life. Oh, I like that. She says, God has been favorable. He's looked upon my life. And Mary shows us how to receive and handle distinction. God has pulled her from obscurity and put her on the main stage of life. Let me park there. Sometimes God plant cannot place us on the main stage. Because we'll try to steal the spotlight. God said, I would promote you. 
But if I promote you, you're going to act like you did it. As soon as your gifts become evident, you start looking down on everybody else and start becoming critical. And as soon as you got a little gift, everybody has to talk to your personal assistant and nobody even knows your name. Mary maintained unshaken meekness, undisturbed humility, Mary refused to become intoxicated with her future notoriety. Alexander McLaren said, a pure heart is humbled by honor and is not dazzled by the vision of future fame to lose sight of God as the source of all. <clears throat> Listen, many, Mary was aware that her new come up was because of God. I close this point like this. Don't let new blessings cause you to forget the old hand. That, 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 that's all. Don't, don't let new blessings make you forget about God. S secondly, God's power is apparent. That's why you can sing in the midst of it all. Mary sung and we can sing because Mary had witnessed God's power and his person in a trifold manner. There are three things that are undeniable about God. Look at verses 49 through 50. He's powerful. Look at verse 49. For he who is mighty. And we forget about that. God is bigger than us. He, he can go up high and not become dizzy but he can become low in tight places and not become claustrophobic. God is mighty, he has strength, and part of his strength is he knows how to reverse the order of life. Look at what Mary says, he's mighty because he's done great things for me. Out of all of the people that God could have chose to be the bearer of the Christ child, he chose Mary. Can I ask you a question, church? Do you ever sit back and reflect how good God has been to you? Have you ever started surveying where you are? And you know, sometimes we always think we deserve to be where we are. But I started reflecting last week. I was upset about a couple of things. And all I can do is start saying, Lord, thank you. I, I, I said, Lord, I don't deserve it. But I thank you because it could have been somebody else. And that's what Mary says. Mary says it could have been, it should have been somebody else. But Lord, I'm grateful that you have shown yourself powerful and mighty. And then she goes on to say, and holy is his name. Holy. We don't talk about that in church too much. We become so casual and cavalier in our approach of worship. We sashay in. We come late and leave early. We sit as spectators instead of being in the presence of a holy God. But when you consider how perfect God is and how imperfect you are, maybe you will borrow the nomenclature of Isaiah when he says woe is me I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among unclean people God you are worthy but I'm unworthy and I wonder is there anybody here that knows God is holy and you are unholy and you don't deserve to be in the presence of God but you're grateful that God has given you another chance so you come into God's house with the reverence your fear that God is holy. Then she shifts and verse 50 says, and his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, Mary is singing. She's frustrated, but she knows God could have chose somebody else. This is what she realized. She's chosen but she's not perfect. Let me talk to somebody who's gifted today. God may have chosen you, but you got to remember you're not perfect. Yes, Mary is a virgin, but she's still human. She's thought some thoughts that she shouldn't have thought. She says, Lord, I know I'm chosen, but I'm not perfect and I need your mercy. And you know in church we shout on grace, but we forget how to shout on mercy. 
Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is what everybody sees and compliments you on. But mercy is God's invisible hand keeping you from the destruction that you deserve. Grace is what everybody sees, but mercy is what God has kept you from, from destruction that nobody sees. Let me see if I can put it where you can get it. Grace is you got a new house. Everybody comes and says, whoa, look at your new house. It's nice. I like the ambiance. I like the carpet. I like the amenities. But mercy is God keeping you in the house and you've never been robbed. Grace is your family portrait at Christmas time. It looks nice. It's husband, wife, children. You look all together and everybody says, oh, you're the perfect family. But mercy is what folk don't see in the picture. How God has kept some things away that should have came to your house. Am I in here by myself? Uh, grace is I got a new car. But mercy is uh, he keeps me in the car without me tolling the car. Grace is I graduated from school, but mercy is I didn't lose my mind in the process. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, grace is what I have, but mercy is what God didn't let have me. I thank God for his mercy. Let me tell you, Mary had heard about God being powerful. She had read about him being powerful, holy, and merciful. But she had moved from what she heard, from what she read, to what she knew. And somebody can testify that you lived in three realms. You heard that God will take care of you. You read about God will come see about you. But somebody can testify, I'm a living witness that God's power will show up. Also, we see God's hand is on our life. God's power is apparent in our life. But also, we see God's involvement in life. Mary shifts from a personal testimony to a general testimony about the people. They have been disenfranchised. They have been almost hopeless. Have you found yourself hopeless? Seem like God's not going to come through? And Mary reminds us that God will help the helpless. There have been times you just too tired to fight. You sick of fighting. You don't have the strength. God says, that's when I come in and I become a one-man militia and I fight for you. He says, I help the helpless. I take down those who are strong. And then he says, I will take care of the humble. Times in life when it seems like everybody is moving faster than us. Seems like everyone else is getting the blessing, the promotion, and they're on top of the world. And you're saying, Lord, how long? I've been prayerful. I've been paying my tithes. I've been faithful. Lord, how long? And sometimes we start questioning what God is doing. But can I tell you, God's promotion plan is better than any system on earth. God's word for you today is if you stay low enough, long enough, God will exalt you in due time. I know you living by the season of spring and summer and fall and winter and you think everything is going to happen a certain way but God has another season called due season. God can step in between winter and fall and spring and summer and God can bless you right at the time of your need. Then he says I satisfy the hungry. Life has a way of leaving us malnourished. Malnourished. We think if I get one more thing, I'd be satisfied. If I get one more car, that'll do. If I get one more bag, I'll be satisfied. If I get one more promotion, life has a way of making you full, but not fulfilled. And God says, if you let me feed you, 
I just won't leave you fooled, but I leave you satisfied. God says, I have a bread that will nourish you, that can, not, can nourish you like nothing else. Finally, not only can we sing the midst of all, God's hand is on our life, God's power is apparent in our life, God's involvement in our lives, but finally, God has handled the rest of our life. Oh, yes. Mary peers into the future, verses 54 through 55. He says, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy and spoke to our fathers, Abraham. Mary looks into the future and says, I can sing because God is going to take care of Israel. He's made a promise. He has to take care of Israel. He's made a promise to Abraham that he'll make his name great because if God doesn't take care of Israel, that means Jesus cannot come through the lineage of David and the Christ child will not be born. This is what Mary teaches us. Mary teaches us how to sing before it happens. Oh yes, you can sing in the midst of your storm and the chaos of your life because we know sooner or later, God will turn it around. Oh yes, that's not cliche, that's Bible. Mary is singing. Before the shepherds hear the angels, she's singing before the magi see the star. She's singing before the innkeeper says there is no room in the inn. She sings that things will get better before she mounts the donkey and takes the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And all I'm trying to tell you is you got to sing before God gives birth to your baby. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to learn how to sing in advance. And you got to make up in your mind even though you don't see it. You make up in your mind that you're not going to lose your song. I'm out of here. Shake your neighbor's hand this morning and say, neighbor, whatever you do, don't lose your song. Don't lose your song while you're shopping in the mall. Don't lose your song trying to get stuff that you really don't need. Don't you lose your song trying to give your children more than what you have. Don't you lose your song becoming overwhelmed and full of anxiety. But you got to learn how to sing anyhow. Have I got a witness? And I made up in my mind that I'm going to keep a song in my mouth. Maybe your song is love lifting me. And when nothing else would help, it was love that lifted me. Have I got a witness? Maybe your song is amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I, I was blind, but now I see. Have I got a witness? Shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor, I got a song. And sometimes when the enemy comes in like a flood, you ought to sing your song all night and all day. The angels keep watching over me. My Lord, God bless your new hope. May the Lord bless you real good. I told you last week, but I tell you again, why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven's home? When Jesus 
is my portion. A constant friend is here. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he's watching over me. But maybe this ought to be everybody's song. Have I got a witness? This is everybody's song. I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had weary days and sleepless nights. But when I look around and think things over, all of my good days outweighed my bad days. And I I won't complain. Sometimes my clouds hang low. I can hardly see the road. I ask the question, Lord, Lord, why so much pain? But he knows. I said he knows what's best for me. Although my weary eyes, my weary my weary eyes, my weary eyes, my weary eyes cannot see. So I learned, I said I learned how to lift up my head and say thank you Lord. I could, I should, but I won't complain. Look at your neighbor and say neighbor, in spite of it all, God has been good to me. I've seen the lightning flash and I've heard the thunder roar. I felt sin breakers dash and trying to conquer my soul. But I heard, I heard the voice of Jesus saying, fight on. Just three people uh, tell him he promised. He promised uh, to walk with me. Uh, he promised uh, to talk with me. Uh, he promised uh, he'll dry my tears. Uh, he promised uh, silence. Just three people tell me, I'm living on the promise. I'm living on the promise. I'm living on the promise. The door is open. Yeah!